everybody, we are back with the Get Ready for 2021 show. Um, I'm really happy to be joined by Nick Ellis. Nick Ellis is from Alots. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about the guest experience and how to make a kick-ass guest experience happen. Uh, welcome, Nick. Uh, cheers. Thanks. Um, yeah, super excited to be here. Great. Look, uh, I guess I always like to, to, to start off and understand who you are, where you're from, and a bit of your background. I know you've been doing this for quite a few years. You are a member of our Facebook group, and what I really like about you is that you're able to add immense value as you go, um, and there's a lot of confidence behind what you say because you've done it all so many times. Um, so, yeah, tell me a bit about what you – or tell everybody about what you do, where you're from, your background, and why – uh, maybe why you like what you do. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So look, I'm, uh, as you mentioned, I'm with the lots at the moment. Um, so we're a, a boutique tech company, but I've actually only been with them for a few months. Prior to that, um, I've worked in hotels my entire life. I literally finished school um, and got a job in the local hotel at the bottom of the street and literally just worked my way up and across um, a number of different hotels and hotel groups. Uh, so about 20 years experience or a little bit more, I'm a lot older than I actually look. And, and, and during that time, I've had some really amazing goals. So uh, I've taken properties, I've done a, a large number of rebrands, refurbishments. I've taken uh, a hotel in Brisbane from number eight on TripAdvisor to number one on TripAdvisor in Brisbane and number 11 in Australia, um, consistently achieving an, an NPS score of 93. Um, the average for a five-star hotel is about 60. Um, I took a different hotel in Brisbane from 107 to number six. Uh, I was fortunate enough to launch a new concept lifestyle brand in Australia, um, and we were number 10 in Perth on TripAdvisor after only three months. Um, and it, it's really interesting that I sort of started my career in, I guess, what I now refer to as the, the high-end stuffy hotels. Um, but over the, the 20 years, I sort of saw the guests gravitate towards this this more personalized lifestyle brand of hotel. So I ended up moving into that. Um, and then most recently as well, I, I work with the Queensland Tourism Industry Council as a judge for the Queensland Tourism Awards. Um, so looking at, at, um, at uh, businesses within the tourism industry and what they do a little bit differently to create those amazing experiences. Uh, you've done all of these things, right? Where, where does your passion kind of lie in terms of where you're going to go to next? And what are your thoughts also um, about what's been happening over the past 12 months? Yeah, it's really interesting because I have no idea what I'm going to next. I, if you said to me 12 months ago that you would be working in technology, I would have laughed at you. Um, I loved hotels. I loved the environment. I loved... Um, interacting with people is just such a massive thing about my personality. So I found like hotels was just like the perfect environment for me to not only interact with travelers, but also build teams and, and those kind of things. I always really had an interest in technology and um, I'm a bit of a nerd deep down and I had enough people in my career say, you shouldn't be in hotels, you should be in a tech company ruling the world. Um, so I took a jump to try that um, uh, and right at the start of um, uh, this little thing called COVID, which I don't know if you've heard about it. Um, it was a great time just to like have a midlife crisis and try a new industry. Um, look, in, in, in hindsight, both industries ended up being massively affected by COVID as well. So um, yeah, I, I basically, I, I think I coined the word pivot because I was pivoting a couple of months before <laughs> COVID hit. Um, but the, the, the thing is um, that I, I guess I never really know where I'm going to end up. I sort of, I'm very much, a, um, I love what I'm doing now because I'm learning something new and, and that, and I loved that about hotels for a really long time. So who really knows what the future holds? So, and so going through the, the COVID part, uh, uh, is this an opportunity? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, so one of the things that I really see is this huge opportunity because um, hotels and the accommodation sector is very much generally quite um, a little bit old school. It's it's not known as a, a change-led industry. Um, COVID has really obviously revolutionised the way the world operates, but in particular, um, uh, particular challenges within the tourism industry. So um, it's we, we see a lot of hotels taking the time to to, to stop, review what they're doing, focus on dealing with, and I hate the, 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 the term, the new normal and all that, um, 
but at the end of the day, like that's sort of what's happening. And I think it's because generally having been there, like we, we spend all this time, we're so busy working in the business that no one ever takes a step back to work on the business. So when that kind of thing is forced on you, um, it really gives people time to stop review how they're operating as a hotel or how they're operating as a, as a motel or an Airbnb or whatever it is. And, and look at, well, what can I be doing differently? Like, um, you know, and, and, I think there's a lot of operators who are coming out of this stronger than they went into it. Um, it's been a, a hell of a kick for everyone, um, but really, hopefully, everyone's going to take some learnings on board and improve the way they operate and improve the way their their business is operating. So, look, uh, I feel like there's so much opportunity for me to digress into into all the new paths that we can follow now that you know COVID is. It's happened and, and the way that we rebuild our businesses. Um, but I think we came in with a bit of an intention as to talking about the guest experience and what that means and, and where it's going um, and what we should be thinking about moving forward. And as you said before, is that you started off in a, in a particular kind of hotel space and now you've moved, you've seen it move and you kind of moved with it. And I think that I'm getting a feeling that you're going to say, hey, it's going to keep it moving and changing and there's different expectations that are coming our way. Is that about right? Um, yeah, 100%, I believe that. Um, I think that, again, um, you know, 20 years ago, my, or my my career goal was to be, you know, that guy at the front desk of the Hilton in my three-piece suit and saying, yes, sir, no, sir. And pretty quickly I realised that actually wasn't me. I had far too much personality to do that. Um, and... You know, and I, I saw then at the same time the rise of the lifestyle hotels and, and this new new age traveller who, um, and it was quite early on in my career that someone coined the phrase, you can get a bed and a shower anywhere, but it's the experiences that people keep people coming back. And I think that that sort of really resonated probably 10, 15 years ago, that really became um, the driver that um, the new age traveller was looking for those experiences. Um it was less about staying in a hotel that had the gym and the the, the pool and the fire and the eight different restaurants. They wanted to stay in the, the cool little hotel that just had the front desk guys that were connected with what's happening in the local area so that when they said, hey, I want to go and experience your culture, your location, your city, um, what is there to do? They're getting that sort of insider um, advice. So um, at the end of the day, that sort of it, the, the the, the underlying need and want for humans generally to travel is to sort of experience other cultures and experience new things. Um, so it's sort of a bit natural that the the hotel and the offering transition that way. Um, I guess who knows where it's going to go. It's going to always develop. It, it, it always will. You know, nothing stops um, a change. So um, who knows in the next 5, 10, 15 years, we may do full circle. I've I uh, did a, a, a thing recently and I had someone try to convince me that in 10 years you'll check into any hotel around the world and it'll just be staffed by robots and nothing else. And uh, I just had a good laugh because I think that uh, us people, we like to interact with other people. That's yeah. why you'll that's always why, see... That's why we didn't enjoy the lockdown, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the funny thing, like I see, you know, the amount of times I've worked at large hotels and someone's trying to sell me like a check-in kiosk and they're like, oh, you can replace all your receptionists. And I just go, but I don't want to. Like my guests don't want to check in with a kiosk. They, You know, you can offer a kiosk, for example, as a way to speed up your queue. And sometimes, you know, some people have had a long day at work, they just want to punch away and check into a room, that's fine. But I still want to know that there's someone at the front desk or at the bar that I can go and have a chat with and, and talk about the local area and those kind of things. So um, there's been a lot of change. Digress, digressing a little bit, it looks, seems like I think, I don't know which of the airlines, but one of them has decided to do that and go pretty much contactless on check-in. Yeah. And there's been a bit of an outcry about that as to whether that's a good move financially. I think that maybe they'll save a few dollars, but in my I think if there's not that much competition, you can do whatever you want, right? But uh, um, in the long run, it might be a bit more expensive. Um, yeah, that's it's really interesting. I, I think that air travel is a bit more transactional in that, like, when I travel, I want to get onto that plane and get out of that airport as quickly as humanly possible, and I'll trade in. Um, I think when you get to a hotel, there's that expectation of that service and that I've travelled a long way, I'm here for, uh, even if I'm here for business, but I, I want to relax while I'm here, those kind of things. So... Um, I think it sort of depends on the industry. I was really gutted when Coles brought in the self-checkout. So I'm like, oh, I don't get to have a, ch a chat as I hand over my money. But 
Um, that's become the norm and we've all sort of learned to deal with it. So it'll be really interesting. As you said, there's a lot of change in the past 20 years. There'll be more change in the next 5 to 10 to 15. Who knows where it'll go? That's sort of what's exciting, I guess. Yeah. And so if we take a step back to what we were talking about before, about the uh, getting the guests to come back um, and improving the experience, I think that there's sort of two sides. And, and one side you might think, hey, it's unlikely that people will come back to my place, but you will get a percentage of the comeback. But the other benefit of, uh, of improving the experience is also for your reviews and that, mm. that's, that side of things. So there is, you might not say, hey, I'll get that direct person coming back, but then you've got the referrals and that sort of uh, network effect that happens. Uh, one other part I did want to add is I think that there is a beauty and an opportunity in terms of having a new market and a new audience that never existed in the past. Yeah. Like that's something that, that it's because of the situation, this is worldwide, you're going to have a new audience. And it is because people still want to travel, but now they have to travel locally. They never thought before of traveling locally, but now you, if they start to engage with you, you need to capture them quickly. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, look I, uh, look, I really agree with that and it uh, resonates well. Um, and it's funny, like I can actually pinpoint the, the power of reviews and um, love them or hate them, but sites like TripAdvisor, the simple fact is they are good for business if you know how to manage them. Um, I can tell you for a personal like, a fact, being there, um, literally the weekend that my hotel took number one in a major capital city, um, we saw a threefold increase in traffic to our TripAdvisor page. Um, and we took a direct uh, probably 10 to 15K a month increase um, from TripAdvisor in bookings. So there was literally a, a tangible, traceable result to the exact date that we took that top spot um, in the new business that was coming. And it was all the people who were, you know, I want to take my partner away for somewhere special this weekend. Where am I going to go? And they just go, right, that's obviously the best place in the city to stay. Um, and that was through, you know, whether we had taken that mindset of, you know, whether you're personally going to come back and stay with me again, but if you leave a review on TripAdvisor, someone's going to read that, someone else is going to make a decision based on that. We also had a mindset that, um, you know, we didn't always take amazing reviews on TripAdvisor. Every hotel has stuff that goes wrong, um, but it was more about the way we responded and, and resolved that um, that complaint or whatever was written and that piece of feedback that was written online. Um, you know, someone occasionally, as we all probably have experienced, someone will make, you know, expect the world and pay nothing and then go online and rubbish you when you're not deliver them a gold-plated Tesla on arrival kind of thing. Um, and that was reflected in our responses that we, we knew that it was a point where we were now talking to the people reading the responses and not so much um, the reviewer themselves. So, um, yeah, look, having been there myself, there is a tangible, um, tangible result from um, putting time and effort into improving your listings and, um, and it all comes down to the bottom line in the end. So going back into the context of, getting ready for, for next year and, and improving these experiences and, and doing all this sort of activity. What, uh, what should our, our hosts be thinking about? Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting you raise that. Um, look, I guess the, the core thing for me was always um, what's exceptional. It's sort of what we always look for. We look for something that's a little bit different. Um, you know, what is unique about you above um, the other bunnies? Um, so I, I think, uh, again, it's a bit of a buzz term, but ultra personalization um, is, is kind of on trend at the moment. So some of those little tips and tricks that we used to do, we we would Google, um, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, search every single person arriving at the property. Um, we would see what they were talking about on Twitter. We would have a look at their likes on Facebook. So, you know, if you have a like of Better Homes and Gardens page, you can go and pop a copy of the Better Homes and Gardens magazine in their room, right? And so subconsciously, the guest doesn't even know that you've made that connection. They just think, oh, they, I like this place because they stock the magazines that I like to read. And would you have that as, uh, I, I don't want to go into the, the nitty gritty of it all, um, but sort of it's time versus reward. Mm. And, you know, all of a sudden now you've got a new process of going and buying more magazines and things like that. I don't think you have to you can be quite creative of how you do adapt to those particular people. What kind of strategies did you have to make sure that 
you're not having a full-time person working. You know, I think a lot of people might say, oh, that's all good and well if you've got the time for it. I don't even have time to to clean the rooms and do all this other bits and pieces. And now you're asking me to do this extra stuff. Um, What are the shortcuts? What are the tricks? Yeah, it's a perfect segue, actually. So I actually have two stories. Um, So I had, um, uh, and it's, I guess the underlying message is about you don't have to run out and buy things. You generally can grab something that you've got around. You do need a little bit of creativity um, and that ability to create a connection, um, but there are ways of doing it um, quickly. So I had um, I had a guest staying with us and he was literally a member of Australian rock royalty, um, absolute top line rock artist from many years ago. And, you know, I'm thinking beforehand, I know this guy's checking in um, a couple of weeks in advance and I'm trying to think, what do we give people like this who stay at every hotel in the world and they're given everything, you know, there's gold-plated M&M buckets, all that kind of stuff. Um, so what do we do um, that can make us stand out as the place that he actually remembers? So um, I all I did was I, I, I skimmed through his Wikipedia page um, and I found out that he's a red wine drinker and I also found out that um, about 30 years ago when he was first courting his wife, he wrote a song about her and it was this really obscure song that, um, but it was actually on Spotify. So basically he arrived off a flight at seven in the morning and I had a bottle of wine in his room and I had the song playing in the background and I had a card that basically said it might be too early for wine, but it's never too early to reminisce. And he came down to me in tears, literally going, that is the greatest thing I've seen in, in 25 years of staying in hotels around the world. Um, I had another, um, again... So, a, so for that, that was, that was you didn't have to go out of your way. And no, that was a, it was a, it was a $4 dollar dollar bottle of house wine with a card that was personalised to him. And that's, people just love the thought. Like, it, it made no difference, the paper and the card and the, the wine itself. And um, it was the fact that we had done, we'd spent 10 minutes reading his Wikipedia page and we'd taken a point that, hey, there was a song that he wrote about his wife, his wife's travelling with him. Um, we can make a connection there by having the song playing in the background. And it was that sort of, um, that uh, I guess the, the we had the Alexas in the room and, as I said, they're a great little touch because you can you can really take something up a notch with music um, and any kind of way to um, add another dimension to an arrival experience. Um Again, had another uh, musician. She had, um, she was tr- literally had booked out the entire property. Um, we'd done a little bit of research. We'd found out that she's a bit of an introvert, um, but she loves reading. Um, so we literally just bought her a biography on her, one of her favourite artists that was one of her inspirations. Um, we left it in her bathroom with some bath salts. And one of my team members who was actually a big fan had handmade a lamp. Um, like with a candle in it and it was a like a streetscape of her home city and again she was quite an introvert and didn't want to interact with people but she took the time to come down and say that's actually really thoughtful thank you so much so um, it it is about sort of grabbing what's around and, and making a connection the one thing that really strikes me with both of those stories is that both times you guys were putting yourselves on the line and taking a risk And there's such a, I imagine, especially with someone that's quite famous or popular, that they do get quite a lot of gifts and they get a lot of things. But for you to really stand out, you're putting something personal on the line that says something about you as well, right? Like you're not going to go and do a card unless unless you're taking that risk to say, hey, you know what? I'm giving this a go. I might have got it wrong, um, but I'm going to give it a go. The same thing with um, the book. Maybe she doesn't like the book anymore. Maybe she doesn't want bath salt. Maybe she doesn't want these things, but you're, you're giving a bit of yourself to them, which is beyond the room, beyond the hotel, beyond everything else that's there. Um, 100% I agree. Um, I used to say to my team that if a, an arrival amenity or an expression or something didn't have a 10% chance of making a complaint and me as the boss having to stand in front of that person and apologise and grovel, then it wasn't good enough. So it always had to have an element of being really, really out there. Um, and to be honest, I never once had to stand in front of someone and apologise to go, oh, we took that too far. And that includes uh, a, probably a, a, a funny amenity that we got for a, a guest um, that might be for an up late edition of this podcast later. Um, but yeah, we, again, we had a, like one of our most regular guests always gets a room of the bath. We're full that time. So we couldn't give her the room of the bath. So the guys go out and buy a kiddie pool and literally put it in the suite with a rubber ducky. And, you know, it's, we, we, 
yeah, we've, you've got to take the chance because that's what makes you memorable. Um, if you just sit there and whenever I check into a hotel and I get a card and a bottle of wine and a fruit plate, I just go, there's just no effort in that. So it's really disappointing personally. <laughs> and and the real beauty is I think that nowadays, so I, I think because we've got such a range of property owners there, they a lot of people might think, you know what, the likelihood of actually getting a guest to come back is quite low or they might not come back directly, or even if they come back once in their lifetime, it's worth $200, $400, $500, $1,000. It's not that the value isn't that big, but the uh, power of social media, the power of reviews, the power of all these things, um, it goes way beyond what it used to be where it would be word of mouth, which is what one in 10 or whatever it was, you mm-hmm. know, and then now it's could be one to, to 10,000 people uh, through these mediums sharing these positive stories. Um, yeah. So there is, there is a return on investment that you can, you can quite clearly see. Um, totally. Again, and a, a, a story similar to those lines is that when I started this hotel, we used to give like a standard arrival gift to most guests would get a like a make your own cocktail kit. And it was nice. It had the little bottle of spirits and some, um, you know, some mixes and those kind of things, but there was no wow to it. And it was sort of presented on a placemat. And um, so we went out to literally just to Kmart and we bought those little wooden boxes that have a couple of drawers in them. And I had a calligrapher drawer all over the front of them and the box became the instructions that it said sort of start with this, mix with this, add a little bit of this. And in the drawers were all the different ingredients. And then we just wrapped them in a $5 set of fairy lights on a battery. So we just changed up the process of presenting the item and um, that and that became so Instagrammable that we had people who would check in and go, I booked this hotel because I wanted to get the cocktail mm-hmm. kit on arrival. Um, and to this day, like you search the name of the property or the, 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 I'm not great with Instagram myself, but when you look at the tags and those kind of things for where we were, you just yeah. see photos of these cocktail kits again and again and again. And it was, um, again, it was just doing that little tweak and each one of them cost us, I don't know, $20 to sort of set up and, and have ongoing. And it was just a different take that became um, really, you know, sort of trended online and we took direct business from it. Okay, so I might be listening to this. Like, oh, cool, all right, these are some great ideas. Um, I might get distracted and get onto some other task. Uh, but I'm, I know I need to come back to this at some stage as well as coming back to all those other things. And it's, as you said, this, these are tasks that are actually working uh, on the business rather than in the business and setting up some process around uh, around creating these experiences and sort of thinking of what's going to work for you as a business owner in terms of the planning. What, what, what do you do? How do you start sort of? Well, getting into this. Yeah, to be honest, it's interesting because really I, I think that you can do doing something really well and remarkable once is not so difficult, but doing it consistently again and again is the real challenge. Um, I think we all kind of know that from the industry that we're in. We know that it's easy to have a guest check in and check out, love their stay, but you've got to be able to do it again and again and again and again. Um, so consistency is key. Um, and again, if I refer back, those little cocktail boxes, right, they became the fallback. They became the when we couldn't think of something better, something more personalised to give to someone, we just give a cocktail box. So we created that process around, okay, step one, we know someone's checking in, do a little bit of Facebook stalking, do some LinkedIn, try and personalise something. Um, we had, um, you know, bottles of wine, we had some magazines on site ready to go. But you know, if you couldn't, if you're running short on time, have your backup that's ready to go, that's sort of unique. You need to put a bit of time into thinking how that can be done. But then once you've got it up and running, you just, you want to repeat it again and again. Um, and it, it should just be something that's really unique to you. Again, we use that sort of cocktail box um, that it was sort of an, a new take on an old idea, but it just became our fallback. So when we had a really busy night and we just didn't have the time um, to, to do all the other things, we could still give something that at least was a, a little bit different. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, look, the consistency, as we all know, it's just so important because um, I guess the, the, the greatest way to disappoint someone is to build an expectation and then not deliver. Um, I've always been sort of an under-promise and over-deliver kind of person. Um, so I, I would rather, yeah, promise nothing and deliver the world because if you fall short of delivering the world, but you still promise nothing and they're getting half of the world, then it's still a positive, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, Beauty, is there anything that I'm missing? Is there anything more that you kind of were, were looking to add to this particular topic? Um, to people? No, I really think that the underlying, it's about personalization, um, doing something consistently um, and being unique. That's the key thing is it's, um, you know, it may not be the, the guests are looking for an experience, right? And that may not be a physical thing that you give them. You may not have a restaurant or an F and B outlet, those kind of things. If you've got a if you've got a restaurant, you know, why not? Um, we used to have a chef who would hand write if we had a VIP or a small group in for dinner. If there was a birthday party, the team would hand write the menus out, and it was just this little wow factor that. Um, those kind of things that are just something that you can do that's a little bit different. Um, work with the, the find local partners. Um, people are looking for an experience. So if you if you have a, an Airbnb in wine country, then you know partner with the the winery that's got the olive grove as well, so that on arrival you can give everyone a bottle of wine, the olive, and that you can put a card with a map from your your Airbnb over to the winery and say, go and see John at the winery. He'll give you an awesome tasting um, and you, you'll enjoy it. They, they're really looking for that experience of those local touch points. Um, they're, you know, everyone's got something in their local area they can leverage off. Um, again, God, I was in, in Noosa and we simply um, – ran a competition for the staff to go out and take photos of the local environment because obviously guests who are staying in Noosa are coming up for um, the national park and the beaches and those kind of things. So we made a welcome letter for every guest, but the, the, the front of it was a card that was printed with a photo by a staff member. So we'd have, this is my favourite spot. It's You can find it via here on the map, taken by John at reception kind of thing. So um, those kind of things, like they that really cost us virtually nothing, um, but it created that connection instantly with the guests to not only the hotel, but the local area, um, those kind of things. And there's there's so many ways for those little touch points to be sewn into um, into the, the guest stay that um, I guess in the current context where we're, we're reducing the content, the so we're reducing the contact um, between guests, that doesn't mean you need to um, you need to give away the guest experience. It's about the quality of the touch point, not the quantity. Um, you can still have great contact without having physical contact, if that makes sense. Motivating teams. Yep. And we talked about it briefly, but I think that I think it could be a really great nugget. If, right. uh, if I do have a team and they are a check-in or they're housekeeping or whatever other other segment of the business they're in and they can add this sort of value how do we motivate them how do we get them thinking in in that particular way to go and do these things because you're you're nick you're the boss and obviously you want you want the place to do well um but how do you get your 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 staff to think like you and to have that mindset to to want to uh take the extra step to make the experience yeah. special um really yeah interesting topic because and again um, the, the, for example, the, the last hotel I went into, which was, um, we took it over and we were a lifestyle brand. And prior to that, um, it was not a lifestyle brand hotel. It was very much a stuffy, you know, um, yes or no, sir hotel. Um, so trying to convert a team, um, from that mindset to a, no, now you need to engage. Like, um, um, it, it's not an easy process. Um, but I guess, Regardless of the size of the team, and as you sort of just touched on, it could just be you might just have one person on reception. It might be a housekeeper. Housekeepers are amazing because they're always contacting with guests. Um, I passionately hate towel animals. However, lots of guests actually love a towel animal. So teaching a housekeeper how to have, um, and I, I know of some properties that specifically like they have a towel animal order form for family rooms, for example, so the kids can be like, I want to see an elephant. Um, but um, I guess, yeah, you've, You've got to show the team how it's done, um, and that's sort of how we did it. So we we created a guest experience by actually focusing on the team experience, if that makes sense. So um, we we engaged with the team, I guess, which is sort of the, the new age version of the old school open door policy. So we encouraged people to talk and to feedback. We, we encouraged anyone to have any idea um, and try and run with it and own ideas. Um, we set the examples um, of what we thought was something a bit different. So, um, for example, one year 
I had seen that um, the upside down Christmas tree was a thing, apparently. And my team were like, oh, how cool is that? So I'm like, all right, cool. Let's do that for Christmas this year. Let's hang the Christmas tree from the roof of the lobby upside down. Um, and the team were just like, oh, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, come on. And so we, we did it. It was a nightmare to actually do. Um, I never realized the engineering required behind hanging an entire Christmas tree from the ceiling. But it looked amazing and people would walk in and they would just be like jaw dropping. Um, it was really this sort of touch point. Um, one year we, we did a, you know, we were looking at what we wanted to do for our staff Christmas party and I just couldn't bear the thought of um, hiring a function room and everyone meeting and listening to 80s music. So um, we planned in, in total secrecy um, and we converted our entire car park to a pop-up inflatable festival. So we rented a 30 meter inflatable water slide. I had the car park turfed. Um, I had an eight meter street art mural painted in the car park on the day um, and 60 pieces of inflatable furniture with food trucks and those kind of things. And we literally did this in, in total secrecy and we didn't tell a single person um, until 3 p.m. on the day. The, part, the staff had been given an invite. They were told it was pool party um, attire. So they all thought we were going to a local pool or something like that. Um, and it wasn't until 3 p.m. on the day when they all received a text message with the address of the hotel. Um, and when they rocked up, we had just transformed this space into something entirely different. But, you know, we, it, you know, everyone had a ball and it was a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, we sort of shown them that we can think outside the box and we can do things a little bit differently. And now, um, you know, that's kind of what we expect of you with the guests, if that so makes pushing, sense. Pushing it both ways. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, and, and it's funny, again, like we just we noticed that the guests started to take note because they would read about some of the things that we did um, online and they would start to play back with us. So we once had a guest book via an OTA and I'm trying to remember the name of the movie star, but he said he wanted this movie star on a pillow in his room, right, as a joke, as, an, as a note in the OTA booking. And we received it when, oh, God, this is a bit funny, but we couldn't just do the pillow, right? So we ended up... Um, we ended up printing 20 different photos of this movie star, hiding them through the room and creating a trail that he had to find all 20, bring them to reception, there would be a prize. And on it was, um, you know, that I played movie star bingo at um, my hotel and a photo on a T-shirt, right? So we, the, the guests had obviously, they'd sort of seen that we had this little bit of a sense of humour and we were creating these little moments and they challenged us to take it up a notch and of course we we had to live up to the challenge there so um but some of those best stories have you know for me it was a job well done because um some of those examples i didn't actually come up with most of them they were things that the team had done after we'd laid out the examples for them you just get to share the story forever yeah <laughs> take the credit um look i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it at that um because i think we could talk for a long time um and uh so i'm gonna say a big thank you um Cheers. i'm gonna wrap it up with a few things uh just one thing with uh, just privacy in terms of people actually going out and you said facebook stalk and i just want to be a little bit mindful of of the terminology that um, we're not encouraging anyone to stalk people in any particular way, but it is about um, getting the information which is publicly available. Exactly. Um, it, information that people are willing to share. You can you can create your privacy policies and stuff like that. So just make sure that you're compliant in that way. Um, you don't have to know everything about them. You know where they're from. You know whether they're bringing kids and that sort of thing. So you can prepare in that particular way. So don't go don't get don't come down on us too hard on that. <laughs> um, uh nick is there so obviously you're from a lot you guys do software as well and that sort of thing so if anyone wants to reach out to you you're available on on a facebook group you're also yeah how how would people reach out to you uh look facebook linkedin um yeah um google i'm sure i'm probably there you can try and not facebook stalk but you're welcome to <laughs> facebook stalk so um yeah look if you if you need to track me down i'm uh, yeah i'll be around there's a bat signal somewhere so <laughs> and the great thing with nick is that if you genuinely have any kind of question he'll be he'll give it a go and, and try to help you out and answer you and give it a bit of thought um which is really sort of a, a testament to why why he's on this uh, show and and doing this um and you can see that the amount of information that he kind of 
gains and in part, it, it goes both ways as he grows. So uh, thank you very much. We'll see you all the way through 2021. Um, anything else? Uh, nah, cheers and yeah, farewell to 2020. Looking forward to next year. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Nick. Cheers. Bye.